Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning, Summit. Happy Mother's Day. I am uh, excited about this weekend. My mom is on her way to my home and uh, her and dad are uh, going to come eat with us. And my mother-in-law drove in yesterday. And so uh, we're going to uh, enjoy a great meal together and uh, time together and uh, really excited about that. And moms, thank you for what you do. Uh, it's not so much what you do, it's who you are. And uh, I know you do the line share in most families, but uh, thank you for who you are. Uh, and I know some of you guys out there, your mom's not with you anymore and, and she's gone on or, or, or maybe you are never able to have children and you yet are a mother to somebody out there. Uh, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for all you do. Uh, you know, I, I echo what Jeff said. I miss you. I look forward to when we get to meet together, and I'm praying that is very, very, very soon. And uh, with all the social distancing and uh, all the things that are happening, we're, we're looking forward to that. In fact, we're making plans right now for you guys. Uh, so when you get back, there's going to be some changes here, some things happening, and, and we're excited about that. But over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about that we're in a battle and the main place that we're in a battle is not out there with COVID-19, not with a foreign entity, not with uh, some secret society out there, is that we're in a battle for our mind. We're in a battle for our affections, our hearts, and, and, and the most crucial battle that we're in and, and is, is, is in this area of our mind and what goes on here because what goes on here affects what goes on and how we see the world and, and our actions and our behaviors and all those things that are happening. And so it's it's important that we understand that while this virus is new and, the, and what we're going through is new, the battle for our mind is not new. It's been going on for generations and generations that there's a force in this world that does not want us to do good, that does not want the church here, that does not want us here, that does not want you to have hope. There's a force there that really wants us to live in fear all the time. There's a force out there that doesn't want you to know Jesus, doesn't want you to live for Jesus if you do know him. You know what I'm saying? And, and he doesn't want us to minister. He doesn't want us to reflect God's mercy. And so we went back to Ephesians chapter 6. And Ephesians chapter 6 was written by the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And, and at the end of Ephesians chapter 6, after he's given instruction on salvation, and he's walked through all these different topics, he then comes and finally, brothers, he gives us instructions about the battle that we're in. And so we've been kind of working through that over that. And so if you have your Bibles or your um, apps this morning, you can go back there to Ephesians chapter 6. But as I shared in our weekly update this last Thursday, you know, last Thursday was the National Day of Prayer, and that was established first in 1952 by um, uh, Truman, Harry S. Truman, and uh, it's interesting that we have gathered as a nation every spring to pray, to ask God to come back, ask God to heal, ask God to intervene, and, and I think over the last few weeks and maybe a couple of months, there's been more prayer offered probably than any time in recent history. In fact, I said this this last week, F.B. Meyer said this, it's on the screen, it says, the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. You know, for the most part, prayer for Christians has really become an untapped resource. 
It's, it's probably talked about more from stages like this and on TV and if you watch Christian television, you listen to Christian radio, it's talked about a lot. But to be honest, it's practiced probably less than anything else we do in the church when it comes to prayer. And yet for the believer, it's one of our greatest gifts that we actually get to commune with the almighty God. It's pretty stinking incredible. And instead of it being an everyday thing like breathing and eating and walking or talking, prayer has almost become a break and break glass in case of an emergency type uh, resource that we only go there when we're in trouble or we're stuck in traffic or our husband won't do, do what you want him to do or your wife won't do what you want her to do or your kids or your boss or, or, or maybe you get a ticket and all of a sudden you break out in prayer and break that glass, you know? And so it's, it's kind of funny, we don't use that very much. And so I love the message translation in Matthew chapter six, because it's so descriptive about prayer. In fact, Jesus was teaching on that prayer. And I wanna read that together in Matthew chapter six, verse one, and then five through 13. Here, here's what Jesus said in the, in the message translation. He says, be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might make good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. And when you come before God in verse five, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Well, here's what I want you to do. And this is Jesus teaching about prayer. Find a quiet place, secluded place, so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and as honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you'll begin to sense his grace. Verse seven, the world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant, ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. For don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like, like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this, our Father in heaven, reveal who you are, set the world right, do what's best, as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil, because you're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. Isn't that good? It's just so simple. I, I just love how Eugene Peterson just gets that whole thing in, in a just down to earth language. You know, when it comes to prayer, we often leave prayer to the super spiritual. We, we leave prayer to those who meet on Monday or we leave prayer to somebody like my mama or your grandma or your grandpa and, and, and we associate prayer with crisis and we just kind of break the glass or we make a production out of it. I mean, growing up in church, you know, you, you, there's certain guys that would come pray over the offering and, and some guys would pray very quietly. Other guys would make a great production out of it. And you know, it's, it's kind of this goofy thing over the years. That's why I love that passage at you Gene translated in Matthew chapter six because it just brings it down to the simplicity of it because prayer was, Paul was somebody who really understood prayer and its power because prayer was a part of his life and he, and, and he took it for granted that it would be a part of our life and that every Christian would be in prayer. And I, I read this, you may have heard this before, but I read this last week is that you really cannot, you, you cannot really be a good Christian and not pray. Just like you cannot have a good marriage if you don't talk to your spouse, you can be a Christian and not pray. Hear that. Just like you can be married and not talk to your spouse, but in both circumstances, you'll be miserable. Because see, prayer is a pipeline of communication between God. Isn't that amazing that our God wants to commune with us, that our God wants us to talk to him, our God, the God, the maker of the universe. And you may not even believe in the God we believe in, but just think about that on the Godhead stuff, that there's a, there, there's a being, there's a God out there. We believe he's the one true God, that he actually wants to talk to us, that he wants to commune with us. And so after Paul lists all the armor in Ephesians chapter six, we've looked at over the last couple of weeks, he then comes down and he points back to verse 10 where we started 
from verse 18. In fact, verse 10, he, remember, he says, finally, final word, last thing, don't miss this. This is important. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Well, how do you do that? Well, look at verse 18. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, before you shoot me an email of going, hey, what about the sword of the spirit? You skipped the sword of the spirit. Hang tight, okay? It's Mother's Day. I just didn't want to come up here with a big old sword on stage on Mother's Day, amen? And it's National Day of Prayer, so I thought it'd be kind of cool that we could connect and, and, and you know, anyway. So come back. We're going to finish it, but we're going to go back to the word next week of the sword of the spirit. But today I want to talk about prayer, what role that plays in your life, how essential is it to you. I know some of you are scared to pray out loud. Some of you don't know when to pray or how to pray. And so I, what I want to do is I, I want you to know this. I want to I try to make this as easy as you can. In fact, I want to teach you today how to act up in your prayer life. How to act up. Yep, I said that. How to act up in your prayer life and be so simple. Because see, just putting on the armor of God theoretically and, and intellectually is not enough because it needs to be in conjunction with the fellowship and communion of God. And it's through the relationship with God that we're communing with him that, that the pieces of the armor come alive and are empowered. Because when we break down this verse 18 in Ephesians, here's what Paul says. We're to pray generally, we're to pray sincerely, and we're to pray specifically. You see, the general prayer is to always pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayer. We pray in private. We pray in public, in secret, in your closet. You pray when you're lonely. You pray when you're fearful. You pray when you're isolated. We've been isolated a little bit lately. You pray when you're in church. You pray with others. You pray always. Sometimes you pray without using words. You ever done that? Sometimes you use in a prayer language if you have one of those. You pray in a formal sense, using prayers in the Psalms and other books. The point is, Paul says to pray always in that general sense. There's a general prayer life that's connecting with the Holy Spirit that's in you, with the God of the universe, that we're connecting with him on a regular, often daily, private uh, occasion. I think of the ways that Danielle and I communicate as a husband and wife, sometimes with words. Sometimes we communicate without words, sometimes with our eyes, sometimes with our body language. Sometimes we just listen to each other's breathing. Sometimes we sense the other and know there's a concern or a joy or there's just contentment. And then there's sometimes we use loud words. <laughs> loud words, right? Yeah. We even sometimes use words that mean something to only us. It's kind of our language and we'll giggle with each other and we'll use those words or we'll use those phrases. And it's just between the intimacy between a husband and a wife. You see, the point is, we connect with each other on a formal level of husband and wife. We're married. And see, that's where some of you stop in your marriage, and that's where some of you stop in your relationship with God. It's just formal. It's just formal. Yeah, you know you know God. Yes, you have a spouse, but it's more of a business transaction. And yeah, Danielle and I have a business tra transaction. If you're raising three kids and you're at home, you've got a business going on, amen? And so, yeah, we have that, but we also have a, 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 a lover's level, that we're connected on a lover's level, an intimacy. And we're also connected on a parental level. Because we have kids. We're raising kids. I was watching Brian Job up on the stage while I go, and all his kids are grown. And just for a moment, I felt a little bit jealous, you know, but I, I long for that day too to see my kids grow up. But right now, Danielle and I are kind of on all those levels. And so there's a general connection for us on every level. And that's what Paul is talking about, that we're to pray generally, to have that, that formal connection with God, but also to have that, that intimate connection with God and, and also have that discipleship connection with God. But the whole point is to pray generally. But the second thing is, is to pray sincerely. All kinds of prayers, he says. Not just one kind of prayer, but all kinds of prayers. I, I love children. And what I love about little children, and sometimes they'll embarrass you because they'll ask for anything, anywhere. And they mean it. 
And it's amazing to me that when I look at that, even new believers that, that first accept Jesus Christ, they've never been in the church, and, and maybe you're out there and you don't know Jesus, but I'm telling you, you get to know him and you surrender your life to him. You may be what I'm about to describe, but I've had new believers come in and they'll ask God for anything and they'll even say things that'll make you blush sometimes. You're like, oh my God, because they're so sincere to know God, just honest. And I believe we need to have those sincere prayers, not just reciting them formally or in unison. There's a time and a place for that. And I enjoy that kind of thing. But to be sincerely asking him and presenting him the desires of your heart. So we pray generally, sincerely, but we also pray specifically and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Be specific with the Lord. Ask him. And if you don't ask, you can't expect to receive. And you're gonna be disappointed because it's like God doesn't do anything, but you're not asking and you're not being specific. Sometimes the Lord gives us a green light when we ask and it's fun and you get to run ahead and you get to trust him in that. And sometimes the Lord gives you a yellow light when you ask. And so we slowly trust him in the process. And then sometimes God gives you a red light and you know what a red light means, no. And so we wait for him. In all cases, we trust him when we go to him and we give him our request. In the going, the green light, we trust. And even in the slow moving process, the yellow, we trust him. And even in the red, when we're having to wait, we trust him. In all cases, we trust him. And so we see Paul's emphasis on the importance of prayer here in Ephesians. And he writes more about prayer in this passage than any other part of the armor in there because he, he knows that this is important for us. And he uses three verses to teach on prayer in the spirit. And his strategy is really quite simple. Pray for everything and everyone. Pray on all occasions. Pray for all kinds of prayers and requests, he says, for all the saints, pray. So let's get practical. How do you act up in your prayer? I wanna give you just a simple way, because I know some of you, you, you downloaded that prayer list from Crosswalk this last week. If you know, know what that is, you can go to our weekly update, you can download that. It's a National Day of Prayer list, but maybe how do you keep going through that prayer process? Now, you've heard me teach on Acts and that prayer model that, that we do, and I'm gonna change that up just a little bit, and, and this may be very familiar for some of you. In fact, some of you are going, yep, I already know, yep, I already know. Listen, don't run ahead, because I think, uh, I love what Bill Heibel said that vision leaks, and for many of us, we sometimes get comfortable, and we're, there's not a prayer plan in our journey. I got a good friend of mine named Clyde that he called me a couple weeks ago, and he lives up in Sanger, Texas, and, and Clyde reminded me that for the last six years, every Saturday morning, he prays for me and you, our church, Summit Heights, and, and, I'm, and listen, he's called me for years to, how can we pray, watches our stuff, he follows us uh, in social media because he loves me and he loves you and he prays for you. This is a guy that's, that's never been in this building, but he has a plan that he follows every week to keep him connected. Just like Danielle and I have a plan that we stay connected in our communion together and our marriage together, that we have, you have a plan to stay connected to God. So it's based on the acrostic act up. And you've heard me teach on prayers and, and um, so I want to modify that this morning. And remember, this is a part of the battle. This is the activation. This is where things come together, okay? When we begin to pray and cry out to God and God begins to move, uh, that's when that armor, the Holy Spirit, when we align ourselves with the Father, this is when these things get fun. It, it gets fun. And remember, this is not a formula, so you can manipulate God because if you can manipulate God, he's not really a God at all, right? Okay, so it's not a formula to manipulate God in a certain manner matter, because remember Jesus warned us about techniques and formulas and all that peddling that was going on then. This is just a way for us to be able to connect with God. So how do we act it with our prayers? Number one, adoration. Key word here is praise. You've seen this before. You know this. In Psalms 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. See, adoration is prayer that praises and worships God. And he's fully worthy of all our praise. In fact, in adoration, we're not necessarily requesting anything. We're just merely adoring and honoring God in our hearts. It's a place to start our prayers because God's worthy of adoration. We're, we're invited not only to enjoy God, but to express our wonder of him. 
and, and how he's incredibly wonderful. In fact, every one of us are hardwired for praise. You may be sitting there and you're not a believer this morning and I'm so glad you're joining us this morning. But understand, the human psyche was hardwired to praise that we give our hearts, our attention, our money, our time, our service, whatever we value the most, we worship. It's hardwired in you and I. It's part of who we are. By worshiping God wholeheartedly with our lips and our lives, we get to do the greatest thing in the greatest way for the greatest one to worship him. You see, during praise and worship and adoration, we're expressing one or more of the following things about God, a reminder of who God is. God, you're our creator. You're awesome. You're the Lord of lords, a recounting of what he's done. You rescued us. You saved us, that, that you provided, provided and are still providing for us. But you're also recognizing his perfection, his holiness. There's none like him that he is greater than, better than, higher than, more powerful than anything else, just that rejoicing in his name, that we lift up his name, praise his name, honoring. And there's this relinquishing that takes place when we begin to honor him and, and worship him and adore him that when you love him, you begin to surrender your life to him. And there's a relinquishment of control when you realize who he is and you're calling out to them and calling out to him the majesty and the power. And this helps us to avoid turning prayer into the one-way relationship. Give me, give me, give me, God, 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 God. It keeps us from just making it one way. And so we adore him, we praise him. I was thinking about this last week that even with Danielle, my bride, is every once in a while I'll look at her and I'll just begin to compliment her on things and thank her for who she is. And it, it's almost every time she's like, oh, couldn't give me more, you know? And the same thing when she does for me, I'm like, oh, babe, tell me some more, you know? Because that's it's something in us. And God enjoys that because it makes it not that one-way street. It's a relationship. But the second thing is not only adoration, praise, but confession. And the key word here is forgiveness. You know, confession is prayer that gets honest about sin. Confession helps us clear the air and address any sin that might be hindering our relationship with God. Getting right and staying clean before God is necessary to remain close to him and be intimate with him. Because we're all sinners, we're all broken, and we all still stumble. And even though we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved, we're not perfect today. And so there's that, there's that confession of sin that, that, that if we're gonna properly serve God and continue to experience his power, then there's that, there's that ongoing confession and repentance and knowing full well that we are forgiven, but we're keeping that road clean between us and God. That through the cross of Christ, that he's provided a way that anyone could be forgiven. You may be sitting out there this morning going, oh, God could never forgive me. Listen, friend, it's the cross that you are forgiven. If you'll acknowledge your sin and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Because you see, that's, that's who we are. We'll always be tempted to rationalize sin, deny it, and just stubbornly do it. But there's no real freedom or joy, just emptiness and unwanted consequences. And many of you live in those consequences. And so confession comes around in our prayer that we're getting serious about our sin. And, and, and as we're confessing that, we're remembering. Remember, Paul's writing to believers here. And so believers, when we're confessing sin, we're then going back and grabbing that blessed breast, breast plate of righteousness that Jesus bought on the cross. And as we're confessing, we're remembering that we are made righteous. There was that great exchange at the cross of Jesus that you and I, when we put our faith in him, that then we are made righteous. We are credited righteous unto him. And so in that confession of making things right, we remember who we are and how we stand, that we are made right in Jesus Christ. Amen. So we adore him. We confess. And then I love this one, thanksgiving, that key word, thankful. You know, God, giving God thanks for what he's blessed us with and reminds us and just provided for us, reminds us of his grace and his goodness. I, I sit in my backyard sometimes and I'm, I'm amazed at what all that we have here in our country, that God is so good, for us, good to us and his grace is so good. I think about all the things that are going on in our country right now. And I think of his goodness and his grace. I look at my children every day and I'm so grateful for them. 
and the decisions they make. And, and then my wife, I think about her and, and just how beautiful she is and how much she loves the Lord. And, and I think about all those things and giving thanks to him is a healthy part of a healthy relationship. It's what it's supposed to do. Can you imagine what would happen if we consistently neglected to thank those we love the most? You know, the sad thing is some of you live that way. Some of you actually live that way. You never get thanked. You never get appreciated. In fact, you haven't even been appreciated this morning yet. It's miserable, isn't it? It's not fun. You see, giving thanks before we take our request to God is appropriate because it puts us in the right frame of mind as God protects and provides and forgives and guides, it, expressing that gratitude allows us to articulate dependence, that we look around and we look at our journey and realize we are fully dependent on God. See, if this thing has taught us anything in this world, even if you're watching and you're not a believer this morning or you're trying to investigate the claims of Christ, here's what we do know. We are much more dependent on God or something outside of us. Wherever you are on your journey, you realize that we are dependent. And so when we begin to acknowledge the holy God who has invited us into a relationship with him, we begin to acknowledge and be grateful and thankful to him, it, it, it begins to articulate our dependence on him, but it also demonstrates our relationship with him, that we are in a relationship and communicates gratitude. It, it changes our attitude and it generates humility. So we have adoration in our prayer where we're adoring God and confession where we're getting serious about sin and then we're thankful to him. And then if we're going to act up in prayer, are you ready for this? Then we got to uplift and that key word is encourage. And you see, this prayer is basically praying for others. And I know what you're thinking. Well, when did I get to my stuff? Hang on. Because see, this is when we pray for others. This is, this is a praying that God's will would be done in the lives of other people. You know, we have people that come to us and, and, and they're frustrated with relationships and they can't solve a relationship. And I remember several years ago, my wife taught me this and, and she said this, that uh, when you have a resentment towards someone or a bitterness towards someone and, and, and you just don't know what else to do, then begin to pray for them everything you would pray for yourself. If you want to be blessed, then you ask God to bless them. If you want your banking account to grow, amen, then pray that their banking account can, uh, grows, amen. And for the next 30 days, you just uplift that person you're having issues with. And you know what'll change? Not necessarily them, you. Because that's part of that uplifting prayer. When you pray for others, when you pray for God's work to be done and for his will to be accomplished, he'll begin to use you and grow you in ways that will astonish people around you. Sometimes I think we do not become what God wants us to become because we're too focused on ourselves and we're too focused on what we want. But it's when we pray for others that we become more like Jesus and as we become more like him, God will grow us more and more and show us and use us more and more. So we adore, we confess, we thanksgiving, we uplift others, and then lastly, we petition. And this is the appeal for God to do or provide something for ourselves. And I love that it's last. I really do. Because God it clearly invites us to share our request with him. That he wants us to share the desires of our heart. In fact, Psalms 37 verse four says, delight yourself in the Lord. And that word delight in the Hebrew means delicate. So in other words, you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna adore him. You're gonna go to him. You're gonna, you're gonna be in front of him. You're gonna, you're gonna protect him. You're gonna value him. Delight yourself in the Lord, the scripture says, and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, when your delight is in God, and honoring his desires, putting others first, he takes that delight in you and he begins to honor those requests and he begins to move in your life. He said, go ahead and ask him. Go ahead and ask him. He's your earthly father perfected. I don't know what kind of father you had, but if you could just envision that we serve a good, good father. He's your earthly father protected. I have a great father. I'm so grateful for him. And I know some of you didn't have great fathers. But see, if you could even take your father or my father and put them into perfection, that's the God we serve. He wants to answer your request. He wants to move in your life. So go ahead, ask him. He is your earthly father, perfected. Act up in your prayer life. Begin to act up, adoring him. 
begin to confess, get serious about sin, thankful. Thank him for what he's done. Encourage others by praying for them. And then make your request known to him. Maybe before you do anything else in the morning, in the morning, you would act up. You just take a moment before you act, do anything with your family, before you go to the office, that you just act up. You just take a few minutes and work through that and to begin to develop that relationship that you would act up before you go to your workplace, before you make that phone call. Maybe before you speak to a client, before you go to a meeting, act up. Yeah, in traffic, in stre stressful situations. And I know some of you today, you've got family in your house and you need to act up. I know, right now you need to stop and act up, right? Because that's the way family will do you sometimes. See, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers, Paul says, act up, pray, to pray. This is your greatest weapon in your warfare is to pray. That we've actually been invited, think about this. I'm gonna say this again. Could it be true that we've been invited to be in a relationship with the God of the universe? Man, that's powerful. It's through Jesus and he's invited us, not through a mediator, not through somebody else to be in direct communication with him. Now that is something I'm interested in, in a God who wants to be in relationship with me and wants me to cry out to him. You see, James 4, 7 says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Because see, when you pray, you're submitting yourself to God. So I wanna close with this. I'm gonna ask the band to come back and they're gonna close this out. And it's another passage found in Philippians 4, 6 through 9. It's from the message translation. And I, I wanna close with this because it's so encouraging because some of you are still sitting there going, okay, Ed, I get it, act up. I, and now I see that plan. And, but now what do I do? Because COVID's still here and things are still happening. So, so let, let, me, let me read this to you and, and encourage you this morning and give you hope. Philippians 4, 6 through 9 says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, look at what he says, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And look what this, this is so good. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. See, some of you, you haven't prayed. You're still trying to do it on your own, and that's why you still don't have that peace. But if you'll begin to cry out to God and, and quit worrying and fretting and, and calling out to him before you know it, that wholeness of God will begin to rest on you and come and settle you down and bring you peace. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Amen? Eight and nine. Summing it all up, friends. I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true. Remember, the mind is the most crucial battlefield. Meditate on those things that are true and noble and reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. And then he says this, put into practice what you learned from me what you heard and saw and realized. Do that and God who makes everything work together will work you into his most excellent harmonies. I love that. That before long, before you know it, you'll have peace. You won't be able to explain it. You won't be able to necessarily put your finger on it when it came. But as you and I begin to submit to God in prayer. And as we begin to draw close to him and we act up adoring him, confessing, getting serious about sin, being thankful, and then lifting the body up, others around us. And lastly, seeking what we need from him. And before long, before you know it, God will begin to work in your journey. Church, I love you, I miss you. I pray you'll act up this week. That your prayer life won't be just a block, box that you break in case of emergency. That it becomes a lifeline, just like between you and your spouse. That you'd be growing in that intimacy of God. 
Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for moms. Thank you that moms, for many of us, I know this is not true for all of us, but for many of us, moms were the ones that taught us about intimacy and closeness. Lord, thank you for moms. Thank you that we get to celebrate them today. But Lord, thank you that today you've invited us into a relationship with you. So Father, if there's somebody here this morning that does not have a relationship with you, give them courage to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may be saved, that they may reach out to us, Lord, when they do that, so we may walk with them and encourage them. And Lord, I pray for the one today that's just really struggling. God, would you give them courage to act up this week in their prayer life? And God, you would do what your word says, that before long, you would bring a wholeness to us. So Lord, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. We worship you today. And we ask all these things in that name. And everybody said, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.